Hello and welcome to WCAT Radio and TV. I'm Kiki Latimer and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. I'm the author of Home for the Homily as well as a number of other books. And uh, so I welcome you this morning. And we have with us today Father Thomas Pulakal and Dr. Jolly John. Beautiful names. <laughs> and um, so they're going to they're going to be discussing with us their their amazingly wonderful um, new book that I've just finished reading called The Art of Listening to Young People. Um, certainly a topic many of us um, need to to know about today um, because of all the young people we have in our lives. So, Father, you want to give us a start with a short prayer and get us rolling here? Sure. Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved Father, we thank you for your for the constancy of your love and goodness towards us. We thank you for being with us here and blessing us in this conversation. Lord, we thank you for the gift of bringing this book um, together, and we pray that it may be a source of blessing for many people and indirectly for many young people. We ask you to bless our conversation today and um, and all those who are listening. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So um, how about you both tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm Father Thomas Bullockle, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a priest for a movement called Jesus Youth as well as an Eastern Rite priest. So I belong to the Cyril Malabar Eparchy of Chicago. And um, I work at a seminary down in Florida, St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary, where I'm a spiritual director and a professor here. So that's me. Hi, um, I'm Jolly. Uh, and I am from Austin. Um, I'm a psychiatric, a psychiatric physician assistant. Um, and I currently work uh, in a clinical setting, seeing patients part-time. And I also work for Morris Christie as the uh, team coordinator for their research institute. Well, welcome. Thank you. It's good yeah. to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us how you wound up writing this book, The Art of Listening to Young People. Yeah. So, um, well, we so in, in Amoris Christi, we have um, we have a little team of researchers. Uh, we we try to be multidisciplinary. So, like we you know we've got Jolly here. We've got um, um, others, medical doctor, literature professor, um, technology, different fields, and then we try we take up different topics and um, with the goal of being very practical. Uh, of producing an output that would be very practical for somebody who wants to grow as a person, grow in in excellence, um, grow in ministry as well. Um, so uh, one of our members, Anthony, he proposed this topic of listening um, because if he's a medical doctor and he was reflecting on how often doctors don't do a good enough job of listening to their patients. You know, they, they tell them what to do, we tell them what to do, but they don't really listen. So that's what kind of inspired him. And then we started digging into it and um, it was amazing. It was a vast and beautiful topic. So that's kind of how that happened. I don't know if there's something I, you want to add, Jolly? Um, no, I think that was pretty well <laughs> summarized. <laughs> I, I'm always amazed um, by World Youth Day um, since you know, JP2 began it back in what the 80s, um, you know, to see, I always joke about, you know, to see all these young people that will flock to listen to this old guy, you know, <laughs> and what an amazing thing that is. Um, so we see young people um, both wanting to listen and to be listened to. Um, and and it's incredible when you think about, you know, you, we just saw it, you know, it's this old white guy, you know, and you just see just zillions of teenagers, young people flocking um, because, you know, because truth and goodness and beauty matters to them so much. Yeah. Um, and, and I think sometimes, you know, we, they get dismissed 
because they're like just teenagers, um, that expression. But but I find young people, I have I have four grown children and 13 grandchildren um, and all their assorted friends and <laughs> relatives and neighbors. And um, so I usually have quite a number of young people around me. Um, plus, I taught in the seminary. And I, I do see a, cert, a, a caring about truth, goodness, and beauty in young people um, that they do want to be listened to. Um, but as you state in your book, sometimes they're difficult to listen to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's uh, Well, I was one of those teenagers who was flocking to John Paul too. So, <laughs> and uh, when, especially when he came to Toronto in... Uh, I think it was 2002. Uh, I was probably 16 or something like that. And um, yeah, I'm glad you brought him up because I would say he's probably the the single most greatest influence, you know, on on my life. Um, and um, yeah, he spoke to our hearts. And and I think what it was is we all felt, if I can speak for all of us, I guess, but we all felt that he really saw us you know as young people he saw the potential and the goodness in us and because we felt like he saw us it um inspired us to to rise up to the occasion you know to, to give ourselves to the lord in that way um kind of like seeing your reflection in somebody else's eyes you know and and it's kind of amazing because obviously i never met him in person but i still felt that i remember really clearly feeling that connection you know as a young person um so it's that's a fascinating thing where someone you don't even know in person or I guess directly, but I guess I felt listened to by him, you know, because I felt like he he knew us and he understood us, you know. In my homiletics book, I talk about how homily sometimes people think that homily is a monologue, but how homily is actually a dialogue um, because you have to be listening to the sheep <laughs> you know you have to know what they're thinking and um you bring out like concepts of language in your book you have to know their language you have to know their slang terms um you know one of the tough things that i found um in communicating and, and listening to young people is they use language very differently than i used it when i was a teenager um, so they'll say things that I would have been thrown out of the house for, you know, but they don't mean it. I've learned in the same way. It doesn't have the same, um, connotation, um, that it had when I was 16 for, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, so, th so sometimes I start out being like horribly shocked by something they say. And I say, well, and I've learned to ask like, well, what does that word mean to you? And it, it doesn't mean half of what it means to me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that fascinates me. You talk in your book about different kinds of listening. Yeah. Charlie, why don't you jump in? <laughs> yeah. So um, we talk about two kind of uh, forms of listening primarily. One is content oriented and the other is um, relational. And um, content oriented um, is more um, you're trying to kind of gauge what the, the content of what they're trying to tell you. Um, and um, relational is where your um, sort of empathy is the main factor there, right? You're trying to be relational to them. And so um, it's about um, understanding what the different types and, and within them, there are in the relational and the content, there's that kind of subtypes as well. Um, and in the book, there's a really good um, um, self-assessment that you can do to kind of see what type of listener you are um, and what are the areas of listening that you might want to improve upon. And as you kind of go through the book and you you learn more and more about the different styles of listening, um, you kind of understand that, oh, maybe I am better at this. You know, maybe I'm more task oriented or maybe I'm not as um uh, criti uh, critical, like listening is not my, you know, uh, forte. So maybe that's something I need to improve on or, or analytical listening. So um, it just kind of helps you to really understand what listening type is maybe valuable where and what conversation and what are the things that you might want to to avoid. 
Um, and we just had a conference on listening and it was pretty interesting to see everybody kind of take this self-assessment and to a certain degree kind of freak out and say, oh my goodness, I never realized that I was such a bad listener, you know, um, or wow, I didn't realize like now I have language to understand like, okay, what is the part of listening that I really need to like work on? Um, but at the same time, it was kind of reassuring like, oh, okay, well, now that I know um, what listening types there are, I, I have hope that I can probably actually become a better listener, right? Because I have a pragmatic approach on what I can I can do. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. If, did, did you yeah. uh, did you see that, uh, Kiki, the um, the questionnaire in there? We found it to be very good. It's it's in the appendix, and it's um, it was it was made by uh, Dr. Graham Bodie, who's uh, kind of like an expert on listening and. We were in a communication with him, and Jolly was actually, and he was very kind. And he said, "You know, by all means, you know, put this questionnaire in your book." And he kind of let us use it. Um, it's it's very helpful. I did not see it, but I will go to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's it's helpful. Yeah. That's yeah. I thought it was interesting that you said most people tend to think that they listen well. Um, I've always thought I'm a terrible listener. <laughs> <laughs> My Maybe. brain is always going. Oh, I have, I have, a, I have a story I can add to that. Or, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Let me tell you all about myself. <laughs> yeah. But I am good at. I don't know if it's listening. I'm good at reading emotions. Mm -hmm. um, partly because I have face blindness, um, mm -hmm. so I'll I'll tend to see and read your emotions. Um, more easily than listen to what you're saying. So um, yeah, with teenagers, sometimes that's helpful, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so you said because you have face blindness, you you pick up people's. Could you say that? Say that again. That was kind of interesting. I have face blindness. So if I ran into you at you know the the supermarket an hour after this interview, I won't know who you are yeah. unless you tell me, yeah. or yeah. unless there's something that really stood out about you, or if I remembered you know something unusual. Like if you had flaming bright red hair, I might yeah. say, "Oh, didn't I just interview you?" But yeah. I might see ten other people with you know the same features. But so your face, even though I think I recognize you when I see you uh, right now, in fact, my brain isn't really holding on to those details that most people consider face recognition. Yeah. Um, but instead, what the part of my brain that it does pick up picks up on emotions more clearly. So I rank when they've done face testing on me up at Harvard. Um, I can't recognize your face, but if you, t I can tell you whether you're sad or uncomfortable or nervous or uh -huh. um, scared or all those kinds of things, angry, all those, those emotional things that show up in our face, um, I can see very clearly. That's um, really which can be helpful with teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's helpful with anyone, I would think. I mean, with anyone, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I see what you mean. Maybe with teenagers, um, they haven't yet developed the vocabulary to express what they're feeling, right? So, if you can perceive it in other ways, and and I think that's something that comes out in the book as well, which is that listening isn't just about hearing words; it's it's receiving what the person is communicating, and the person is communicating through a variety of means. All, all at the same time, you know, it's through words, it's through facial expression, it's through tone, it's through body language, um, and other things too, like um, less tangible things like the context, um, which plays into it as well. But um, it's how much can we receive everything that's being communicated? You know, I think that's what makes us a good listener. And uh, the Lord, uh, you know, has created us with that capacity, like, so like for you, Kiki, you you have uh, this face blindness, but you have certain, seems like you have heightened abilities in, in other areas. And I think for all of us, we're given different faculties to be able to, to listen. Um, of course, we have to invest in it. We've got to improve those skills, but um, to be able to listen to, uh, to other people well. And Sometimes it's, um, I've had certain experiences with young people where I've just, you know, 
I've learned to pray while they speak um, mm-hmm. to say, okay, what, what, why are they here? You bring that out a lot um, in your book, which I thought was wonderful. They're, you know, they're that they're saying something and then what are they saying? But then the big question is why are they saying it? Yeah. And, and sometimes I just really hear the Lord say, you know, Kiki, just keep your mouth shut for a bit mm-hmm. and just, be silent, just be silent and, and let the silence do its own thing. Um, and I find that that's really hard sometimes is just to allow the silence to do its own little magic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, think- I had a young woman who um, came to my office years ago at, at the university when I was at the University of Rhode Island and we had just finished the abortion topic in class um and i we don't really we at the time it's a secular university so we would wear both hats pro-life and pro-choice and go back and forth on the arguments but we had just finished that and she came in to speak and i think she had gathered that i was pro-life but i tried to keep keep it under wraps as best i could you know because usually at a secular university they would assume i was pro-choice because i was a woman Mm. Um, so I, I, I had to tread very like lightly to get my message across. And it was an exciting class because most of the kids came in pro-choice and went out pro-life. So it was a very exciting um, ministry at a secular university. And, uh, but this young woman came in and she came into the office and she sat down and she said, um, you know, and she didn't look too good. Um, and, um, she said, I just, you know, came in to tell you, um, that I had an abortion at the beginning of the semester. And I just wanted to let you know that in my situation, it was the right thing to do. And I just said, okay, (laughs) I understand. That's all I said was I understand. And she went through how she was brought up Catholic and had always been pro-life and, you know, all the things her mother had said and how this young man had wanted to marry her, but he wasn't the right person. And I just kept saying, I understand. And then finally, she and she just kept repeating, it was the right thing to do. You need to understand it was the right thing to do. And then there was just this silence. And I wanted so badly to fill that silence with anything. (laughs) Um, But I really was praying. And I, I just kept hearing God say, like, don't open your mouth. Just listen to the silence just let the silence speak for itself. And and so that's what I did. And I felt like there was silence for hours. I mean, it was probably minutes, maybe it was seconds, but it was a deep, abiding, thick silence. Um, And I just let us both listen to that silence. And then finally she said, um, I still speak to him every day. And I didn't know whether she meant the boyfriend or God, because she'd mentioned her relationship with God. And I was like, well, which one? (laughs) And she said, oh, the baby. And I was then able to, you know, say, um, well, what, what do you say to him? And that's when she said, you know, I tell him I'm his mommy. I tell him I love him. And I tell him I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. And it just all came you know um and i always remember that as one of probably my deepest listening times with a young person um because she came in with this what looked like this uh, this pro-choice pro-abortion agenda um and it was the silence and the listening that broke broke it all down nothing that i said (laughs) everything that i all i had ever the only two words i had said the whole 20 minutes of it was i understand (laughs) that's incredible what a beautiful and um, yeah 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 i remember that it was like yesterday but it was it was my it was a moment of listening but i think i was listening more to god than to her you know (laughs) Yeah, well, I think they're 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 kind of the same, you know, in, in a sense. Because um, how do we? How is it possible to encounter another human being who is actually a mystery? You know, when all we're met with is their words, perhaps 
their feelings that they communicate non-verbally, but like the, knowing that the person is much deeper than that, like in this example, what her soul, you know, what she's really going through is much deeper than anything we can penetrate with our minds or, and, and I think that's what the Holy Spirit was leading you into. It's like, yeah. as you listen to the Lord, he helps you to really genuinely and truly encounter another person, right? Um, we are such a mystery to one another. You know, we have these little cues to go on what we say, yeah, how we look. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if um, Anthony, you know, when he started this project, um, I had similar sentiments as him because. Uh, being in the field that I'm in, like psychiatry, I feel like there's so many times when you are met with, you know, when a patient walks in through the door, you have one goal, which is, I guess, task oriented listening, right? You are get what they want, what what they're telling you, do something with it, and then send them back happy, right? Or or help them in some way. So it's interesting that you um, kind of brought that part up because at least. At the beginning of this project, something I think Anthony was mentioning was that um, you want to jump in and you want to help, but there's sometimes you're put in positions where you all you can do is just listen, right? Um, and for me, I would say that has been such a learning curve as well, because my tendency is to jump in as a provider, jump in and say, okay, what do you need? What can I do? How can I help you? How can I make you feel better? Because uh, they're bringing in their sort of in that appointment such deep burdens that they have that they haven't shared with anybody else and it's like they're trusting you with all of this and what do you do and and your you know my gut instinct would be to help um especially young people they're they're coming in and they're asking me well can I tell you something that I've never told my parents or any of my friends and because we have that confidentiality you know they're they I can assure them yes you can tell me and then they pour out all of this stuff and at the end of it, I'm just sort of sitting there and going, okay, wow, now what? What do I do? I, there's nothing I can do, right? Um, um, they've told me things that you really just can't do anything about. And it has forced me. I wouldn't say I knew how to do it. I think the profession in some ways and taught me how to pray, like you were saying, when a young person is speaking and then forced me into a place of silence because there was no other option but just to be in silence. And then you see a completely different um, uh, kind of story coming out, you know, kind of like what you said, they come in with one mindset. Okay, well, my, you know, this happened and that happened and I'm completely against it. But then you leave space for that silence and then they start to slowly bring out all this inner conflicts that they have, whether it's with themselves about you know what they're choosing to do with their life and what, whether it's with relationships whatever it is and I found that that was probably maybe the first time somebody has given them space to just be listened to and not say anything and um and that that was it I never had to prescribe medications I never had to do anything else but I just had to give them space and that silence to just be listened to. And um, I think that was a turning point for me because it made me wonder, well, how much of depression and anxiety and all of these things that we see um, in our communities is related to um, not being listened to. It's very painful not to be listened to. I, I think you're right that just sometimes young people, but for all of us, just being given the space to to say what you're thinking, to to try to express what you're feeling. Um, you know, you mentioned those the three things were they dignity, healing, and relationships. Dignity, healing, and dignity of the person. When we're given that space, just to say what we feel, you know, if we're in pain or we're confused or we're angry. Um, it's not so much sometimes that we want someone to fix it. Um, we just want the space to get it out of, get, let the, you know, it's like, you know, tears are this thing where the body kind of overflows and, and, and speaking in that sort of sacred space when you're, when you trust somebody, um, 
it allows you to fix it yourself. It's not that you're asking them to fix it. You're, you're just getting that dignity and respect um, for your person. And um, that's so important. It builds the relationships and it helps you to heal yourself. It lets, you know, it lets, it lets you open up to grace that, that, you know, so I think sometimes, you know, someone comes to us and we think, oh, and they pour out all this stuff. You think, oh gosh, I got to fix this. And sometimes we're, we're you know, um, well, I, I went to confession once. I mean, I go to confession often, but I went to confession one time years ago to a priest that I had been told, don't go to him for confession. He's, horrible in the confessional and I always say if it had been my first confession it would have been my last um because he decided after my confession to fix me and um told me everything I should get rid of in my life which at the time felt like it was my whole life and um so I, I left like beaten up out of the confessional you know um thank god all my the other nine million confessions I've made have not been like that one um, but he had this need to fix me. Um, and we sometimes, I think when people come to us, especially young people with their problems, and sometimes we can see what needs to be fixed, mm -hmm. you know, we'll get rid of that horrible boyfriend or get rid of that horrible girlfriend or, you know, get rid of that bad job you're in or stop hanging out with your friends that are a bad influence. Um, but that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking to be fixed. They're looking to express their fears about what they're in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think your book really talked about that very well. This, this being a sounding board, listening. Yeah. I, I think what, what you're talking about Kiki is so important and it's, and in some ways um, this makes a lot of sense to us as, as Christians, right? Because the Lord is working directly in the, in the heart of each person. Like, you know, I do the Ministry of Spiritual Direction, and one of the, I guess, principles of it is that the Lord is revealing himself to the other person. You know, the Lord is working with the person. Like, I don't need to jump in and save this person. You know, my job is to listen and to help them to listen um, more to the Lord. And if there's any... Um, I don't know if there's any areas of confusion or if there's different ways we can kind of tie ourselves in a little knot or become self-consumed or something like that, just to point them in the right direction. But it's always for them to receive from the Lord, you know. And But I think in the, in the secular profession, too, there's been such a recognition of that. Uh, like we, we quote from uh, Carl Rogers quite a bit and in the book and you know, for him, it was th this whole idea of, um, uh, you know, it's it's the person. It's the person who has the inner resourcefulness to rise up and to, you know, to overcome the obstacles and challenges that they have. And through empathic listening, what we're doing is just kind of being that sounding board, being that encouragement for them, providing that space where they can actually um, see their own inner resourcefulness and overcome the challenges on their own. And I think we we really do have to look inside to see what is that tendency in us that says, oh, I got to fix this person. I'm, I'm the person to fix this person, you know? I think there's there's a lot of room for examination there in terms of what's going on. And, and if I could just go back to the example of the student who came to you, I think one of the great things that you did there, um, Kiki, you know, by God's grace, but also through your cooperation, um, is that you didn't obsess on the wrongness of what she was saying. Like she said, oh, in my case, you know, doing abortion was the right thing. And it can be very easy for us to fixate on that. Like, no, that is wrong. Like, you know, and, and now I can't listen to anything else the person is saying because that's wrong. And one way or the other, I got to say that, you know. Um, but I think the beauty of what you did is you know, we kind of talk about this in the book. Uh, we call it person idea conflation, you know, which is I'm more interested in the person. I want to listen to the person. People might talk about ideas with a lot of, uh, you know, intensity that doesn't necessarily mean even that they fully believe that idea we got to go past that to listen to the person you know um so that that, was, i think you, what you shared is a great example of that yeah 
that was one of the things I had that star here. I have, I have a zillion notes here on your book pages. Um, that was one of the things that I have a big star next to. I have the passionate expression of an idea does not necessarily equal um, thoroughly embracing the idea. Yeah. Um, but it might just be a sense of belonging or a protection or to keep you from being ostracized by your group. Um, I, I, I was fascinated by that. I, I, I think I sort of knew it, but maybe in, like, you know, way down deep somewhere and you brought it up to the surface. Um, yeah, or it could be guilt, it. you know, like, which is, I think, going to the example that you brought up. Sometimes we're, we're passionately defending an idea because we're so afraid of the shame, you know, around what we've done or what we feel like we had to do. And so the only way we can stand, the only way we can survive is by trying to passionately defend that idea. You know, there's all different kinds of reasons. You know. Right. Even though deep down you haven't embraced that idea at all, possibly. And when I read that, I thought, wow, you know, I mean, I'm sure we all do that at times, but teenagers, I think, are famous for that. I could picture myself doing it with my parents, um, just, just, you know. Um, almost as a challenge, you know, almost I'm going to, you know, I've got to assert my independence and sort of challenge the world because it makes you this independent person. Um, it makes you your own person and, and being your own person, especially as a young person is so important. Um, yeah. So, you know, putting things out there, especially that like, you know, we're going to really irk your parents <laughs> or make their ears cringe. You know, that was our famous thing at, at the dinner table was this like, something that would like freak my mother out, you know, and then we'd <laughs> hold on to it, you know, um, because, you know, we could we could think on our own now. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So to kind of realize that people will express um an idea and, and and not to just sort of connect them so concretely with the idea that you can't pull the two things apart, you know, uh, with that young woman. Um, I mean, she was pretty adamant you know, that this was the right thing to do. Um, is you know, like you're saying, I didn't fixate on that at all. I had to just let this erroneous idea go and, and look at, well, why is she here? Why is she here? I kept saying, why is she here? Yeah. Tell me why she's here. Because if if she thinks I'm pro-life and she's pro-choice, well, why are you here? You know, what do I, what do you care? We didn't even know each other. She was just a student, one of a hundred. Um, I didn't know her well or at all. Um, she, we were basically strangers to each other. So, you know, you sit there and you think, well, why does this stranger care what I think? You know, why does she want me to know? So, um and when the grandkids show up here, I, I had one of my grandkids show up the other day, you know, just in tears. He and mom had had a huge blowout and uh, he's about 14. And, uh, you know, again, there's a thing, okay, why has he come to granny? You know, <laughs> has he come to the old lady here? <laughs> What's he want? You know, um, and, and you realize the first thing he wants is that safe refuge. Mm -hmm. Just wants to be heard, you know, just wants to be heard. I was like, all right, what'd you do? What'd she do? You know, and I won't just say, what did you do? It's like, okay, what did mom do? You know, what did mom do wrong? <laughs> you know, so I get to hear he gets to voice what mom did wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, how did you react to what mom did wrong? Oh, that doesn't sound too good either. <laughs> and um, then I told him, you know, he has an undeveloped frontal lobe and hang in there. <laughs> what, you told him that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was like, "What?" <laughs> so um, he, he thought that was pretty funny and interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, he did. He really just needed some safe space um, and uh, to to work it out. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's maybe I did tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's actually amazing because once a person feels like they're truly heard and listened to and understood, I mean, all like myself, if I feel like I'm understood, listened to, I become genuinely open to receiving guidance, you know, 
um, because I can trust the person. They've they've made the effort to really understand where I'm coming from and and kind of rather than speaking to me, they're they're walking alongside me on the same journey. And whatever they say to me, I feel like is is said by a companion, you know. And um, so it opens up the door to being able to really help people um, when we when we listen to them. You know? It really does start with love, you know. That I love you. I respect your your your. I give you that your dignity. Um, you know, one of the things that well, I do a philosophy class with the kids, and I talk about how. Um, you know, moral dignity can be gained and lost. You know, you can do rotten things and you lose your moral dignity, but you never lose your ontological dignity. Mm. You always have your your dignity as as a child of God, made in the image and likeness of God. Um, that even the worst criminal has that um, dignity, and and so we we you have to start with that. Uh, the you know you call it you talk about the mystery and the wonder of the human person you have to start with that um if you see somebody's you know moral degradation or confusion or you know the stuff you don't like first <laughs> you start with that you're just you're forget it you know communications over yeah yeah as part of her um book we did several interviews with with young people and um, and also some surveys. And uh, we had one of the questions is, would you, you know, do you want practical guidance when somebody's listening to you? And there was a pretty high number that said yes, you know, and even in one of the interviews, uh, one of the young persons said, I value older people telling me uh, uh, what they went through and the guidance that they can give, because if somebody is a few years older than me, 12, 10 years older than me, um, they can relate to it. They have been through that. And what they have to say, it's, it's like I'm not reinventing the wheel again. I can learn from those experiences. But often it's hard to do that when you are not met with empathy first, right? Um, and so in therapy as well, we have this saying that um, the, the, the client um, knows what is right and what, it, what to do. You don't have to give them the answers. They have the answers within themselves. And what we are called to do is be sort of like a mirror to them, right? And asking the right questions or trying our best to ask the right questions can um, kind of take that foggy mirror and clear that up over time so that the answers within themselves are revealed. And they can do um, what they knew all along should be done. Um but it has to be placed alongside with empathy in order to in order to be effective. And um, you know, when when we're growing up, one of the developmental stages is autonomy, right? And um, at a young age, when autonomy is taken away from us, um, that can have a lot of detrimental psychological effects. And it often happens if you have helicopter parents or if you are brought up in a society that is very hierarchical and tells you exactly what to do every time. Um, but when we create a space for listening uh, with open-ended questions and being that mirror and asking the right questions, it gives space for that person to kind of reclaim that autonomy. And at that point, when you offer them uh, guidance, practical guidance, they are able to take that autonomy and actually use it for the for, for after a long time and use it in a way that makes sense, right? So, yeah. I mean, some of listening is humility, um, you know, that just, um, <clears throat> I was thinking of a situation years ago, I, my sister was here, and somehow we wound up looking at pictures of her children when they were little, and they were little around the same time, I think, that my children were little, and I said something to the effect of, I don't really remember your children when they were that little. You know, and her response was, well, that's because you were a real jerk back then. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Um, and but I, I was one of those times where I think, thank by the grace of God, I managed to just be quiet and, and just think and thought to myself, well, 
why don't I remember her children back then, you know? <laughs> maybe she's right. <laughs> you know, maybe I was a real jerk at that time and, you know, wasn't in any kind of a relationship with her that I should have been. Um, so it was kind of, it was kind of interesting in, instead of just responding in anger, because she obviously had, there was a lot, there was anger attached to her statement. Um, but instead of responding in anger, I, I just thought about it for a little bit and thought, well, what if she's right? <laughs> and sometimes that's really hard to do. Like, it's kind of icky to oh. think, you know. <laughs> It's very hard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but it was one of the moments I think that helped our relationship and we're much closer now than we were um, at that time. And I think one of the things was, is I just listened to her mm -hmm. statement, even though I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> um, but I, I realized there was, there was some truth in it perhaps and that I needed to look at. Um, I work with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Stephen Schwartz, and uh, his father was Baldwin Schwartz, the philosopher. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was best friends with Dietrich von Hildebrand, um, and they both were friends with uh, St. Edith Stein. In fact, uh, St. Edith Stein held Steve when he was a baby. <laughs> oh. And... Um, <laughs> yeah, so you're only you're now only two people removed from Saint Eustine. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but he remembers. Um, you know, Dietrich von Hildebrand hated any kind of error, philosophical error, religious error, um, and his reaction to error was to get extremely upset <laughs> and uh, wow. you know rant and rave and yell about the error. And Baldwin Schwartz was the one who would say, but wait a minute, this person who's in error has seen something. They have seen something. And, and so and then Dietrich would, because truth was so important to him, he'd, he'd calm down and say, all right, let's look together at what this person has seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes in communication with young people, there is that tendency to just to see the error, yeah. <laughs> the error of their ways. You know? yeah. um, but yeah. usually they have seen something in the midst of, of whatever they're confused or upset or angry or hurt by. Um, they have seen something. Um, yeah, and, I, I think if we can give... You know, just if we can give people the space to really let out, let it out, say what they really think or believe. And um, like even from like Jolly mentioned, when we talk about the different listening types, broadly speaking, you can say there's content oriented. Like what's this person trying to communicate or say? And then there's the relational listening, um, which ha which has more to do with what they're feeling, you know, and the, but even, even when you think about it from the content point of view, right, if a person is expressing an idea, and particularly a young person, if we give them the space, first of all, it's a sign of deep respect, right? Um, I want to hear, I want to understand what you're saying. Like one of the things that um, I, when I would teach CCD, I, I taught um, like in, in the parish where I was at, we had uh, CCD up through 12th grade. So I taught 12th grade, you know, for four years. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, so people express all kinds of viewpoints, as you can imagine, <laughs> you know, especially if you give them the space. <laughs> and, I, and I tell them that right at the beginning, I'm like, you can say anything, you know, this is a place for us to really talk about stuff. You can say anything, you know. And so people would express their views on whatever, abortion or, you know, euthanasia or mercy killing, you know, and from how they would see it and when they would make a genuine point and i would say something like um you know you know that's a really good point and and i mean it like i can see that you know for example they're talking about um euthanasia and it's like but the person is suffering you know and they're in pain and they just want to die and i said you know what that is a good point and i acknowledge what they're saying without fear like meaning in myself, I'm not afraid of acknowledging what's, you know, what they're saying. All of a sudden, you see the tension release in the room. 
because they're like, oh, this is truly a conversation. This is truly a place where we're, we're going to really talk and try to arrive at the truth and, and things like that, you know. And we would learn so much from young people if we can give that space and not react to this error or that error, or whatever, because they know a lot. You know, it. I think most people would be amazed, even from their teenagers or teenage children, if you really listen to them, I think we'd all be pretty amazed at how insightful they are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I just took a trip with five of my grandsons well, a week and a half ago. And I always say they keep me young. They keep me um they keep me connected to the world. They keep me connected. They're very real. Yeah. You know, they're real. Um you can't get away with anything, you know. Um and and that's a, that's a beautiful thing to be around. You know, they don't. There's no fakeness when you're with young people. Yes. If, if they feel like they're respected, they're just they're just real, and they say what they think. And um, but you also get to hear their view of the world, which is changing. You know, yes. it's this different world. Um, and trying to to see it, you get a chance if you spend time with them to see it through their eyes. Um, and it does keep you young. It, does, it gets you out of the world you grew up in. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the changing of language. Um, that that was amazing to me over the last 10 years, um, was seeing how language changes. And I couldn't stay stuck in my, my view of language, you know. It was like, you know, I, I, you have to get out of that. You know, language changes. <laughs> That's all there is to it, you know. <laughs> To assume when they say X that it means what it meant when you were 16 and you said X, you know, it's like, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. You talk in the book at times when there's times to stop listening, which was, um, I was really grateful that that was in there. At some point, I was thinking of different times um, when we need to stop listening you want to talk about that a little? I was glad, you know, it was it was good that it was in there. But there's limits. There are. Yeah, Jolly, you probably can speak to this best uh, from your profession. Yeah, um, I think first, one of the things that we mentioned was something called secondary traumatic stress. And that usually happens when, um, I would say it's probably not as common in the general population as it is, I think, for our profession where somebody sharing something very, um, um, they're, sh they're sharing something that is um, exp extremely traumatic, but they're doing it in a way where they're sharing all the details. And it's almost like you're kind of reliving it through them, you know, or they're reliving it again in front of you and you're kind of taking that on and you start to experience some of that trauma yourself. So um, in worst case, scenarios, you know, you, you have people who will experience uh, panic attacks and recurrent dreams and all of that uh, uh, kind of PTSD-like symptoms um, just by listening to people, especially if you are very uh, empathetic um, and you have a very vivid imagination. But like I said, probably not very common in, in the general population. I think what hap tends to happen uh, most for other people is that um, in in listening to another person, you become a little too involved and you start crossing boundaries where they become extremely dependent on you um, when they're trying to make you know, decisions about their day-to-day -day, um, choices. And um, it goes from maybe having conversations, a general kind of overarching conversation about some struggle that they're going through to calling you up or wanting to talk to you, you know, um, as they're working through that problem very, very frequently. Um, and at that point, um, you kind of get the sense that, okay, they're, you know, they're not able to be autonomous. They are not um, doing what they're, um, they're not being independent um, in their, uh, in their um, uh, decision making. And at that point, you want to make sure that you are, setting uh, healthy boundaries. And the other time can also be when, I think it's something that you guys had just uh, talked about a little earlier, where you want to know why you are um, overly involved as, and you're the person who is 
um, offering suggestions and then suddenly this person's not taking them and you find yourself to be upset about that. You know, that is usually an indicator that, okay, there seems to be some sort of self-involvement here. It, you, you know, sometimes we listen because it feels good to us when a young person comes to us and shares struggles and we give them guidance and they're doing everything that we're telling them and things are going well, it, it can be very, um, self-centric it can boost our egos you know so a lot of times we can find ourselves listening because we ourselves are getting something out of that and at that point you also want to make sure that um you're drawing healthy boundaries and if you feel like you're overly involved at that point maybe making the decision to step out and um asking somebody else to um to tag team for that for that support i think that's a very that's a very difficult area you know, when you realize you're just sort of enabling a situation or the or the relationship isn't is no longer helpful and appropriate. Um because you can feel like the fixer. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh I'm I'm you know. Yeah, I, I was I was sharing this with a with a group of um spiritual directors and then you know, one of them pointed out it's like, well, sometimes that you know, you might feel really good about yourself if somebody really depends on you and they, they, they depend on you for making all these decisions you might it might be almost validating you know because you're like oh yeah i am really helpful you know and and so that's where we have to be conscious of our own insecurities because i think that can play into those some of these patterns you know um like there is a, actually one of the at our listening conference one of the one of the young people um, who, who was there, I mean, I don't know how old she is, maybe 19 or something, but, um, and this is what I mean about listening to young people because they're wisdom, but she, she raised the question of like, well, what do you all get out of this, <laughs> you know, listening to young people? So I'm like, why are you talking about this? What, you know, is there something you're trying to gain out of this whole thing, you know? And it's like, yeah, it's something for us to examine. I mean, um, because if the young person becomes a means for me to fulfill some need of mine, or for any other reason, if the, if another person becomes a means, um, then it's no longer a true act of charity, and and the other person is also going to rebel against that because nobody wants to be reduced to a means, you know. In the ethics class, I always talk to the kids about when we get into virtue ethics, how they're you know prudence overarches all the other virtues and humility undergirds all the virtues I like that. Um, yeah. and, and those two are you know tough things you know <laughs> prudence and humility have to surround love um, or we usually botch it up pretty badly <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah love can become something else right um yeah one of the things you said at the end, and I, I wrote this quote down, was never affirm behavior or choices that you believe are harmful. So I'd like to have you talk about that a little bit, because we do sometimes, we are with young people, um, we see that they are doing something that's harmful um, or making choices that, you know, could be really disastrous. Um, and how do we with love say, don't <laughs> you know, stop it <laughs> well you know there's a lot of nuance there right so um like going back to the example of the person the, the young person that came up to you where you can say i'm with you i understand i understand what you're going through that's one thing but when you find yourself um and affirming the, the the action itself or in other words saying yeah what you did was right you know in that situation now obviously it probably wouldn't happen with with big things it it starts with a lot of little things um you know maybe there's a student who is <clears throat> failing their class and so the student might say oh, this teacher is so unfair this quiz just came out of nowhere and we weren't even you know and you listen and you're like oh now it's one thing to say I understand. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of emp empathically listening. It's another thing to say like, oh man, that is really unfair. That's why would the teacher do that? That's so, you know. So you start 
what ends up happening then over time is like you might be encouraging the fact that uh, the student is really not studying or whatever. You know, you might be um, reaffirming negative patterns and and you're always going to be that person. And, and that just becomes a pattern, you know, where for you, where you keep affirming their negative behaviors, affirming their negative behaviors. And then basically what you become is an enabler at that point, you know, and um yeah, so I mean that that would be a, a, a dangerous thing, and then you get in you get locked in, where the minute that you bring up a criticism, or you know you you say wait wait a minute you know the person is going to react because they've become kind of addicted to your affirmations you know, um, so we have to be judicious we have to be very thought we have to be very intentional, what are we affirming here? You know, I've got to I've got to stay within the bounds of truth in anything I'm affirming. I could be with the person, I can understand what they're going through, um, you know, I can empathize with them, but I can't affirm something that fundamentally I don't believe in, you know, or I think is wrong. That's a I think that's one of the toughest things. How, I mean, I was thinking like, how do you nip that in the bud? So you you have a conversation, and you know, afterwards you realize like, eh, I really shouldn't have said that. Yeah. How do we? fix that the next time we talk to the person? I mean, would you go back and say, look, you know, last time we talked, I know I said such and such, but I probably shouldn't have said that to you. I mean, would you try to, would you correct it? Like, how would you nip that or would you just move forward? What, what I would do is I would talk about it more in general terms um, about the nature of our conversations. Um, like, for example, this could come up if you are giving guidance to a married person, you know, so they can talk about their spouse and you don't have any, any, you don't know their spouse, you know, so, so everything they're saying about their spouse, you're just hearing it from their perspective, right? Um, so like, sometimes it's helpful just to tell the person, listen, you know, I, I, I'm not a mediator between you two. I don't even know your spouse, perhaps, you know, um, so I can't. I can't, you know, make a judgment about who is right or wrong in a given situation because I'm only hearing it from from your perspective, you know. And that's something I've, I've I've just told people just straight out, and so then that sets the tone for the nature of our conversations, you know. Like if it's as in spiritual direction, I, I'm here to help you bring all this to the Lord and seek His guidance, you know. Um, so th th at least that's the way that I, I would approach it, um, you know. And if sometimes you cross that and then you start taking sides. You know, you have to, and you catch yourself early, just having a conversation about the nature of our relationship and conversations, I think, can can help. I think it also helps to not put so much pressure on ourselves. You know, I think one of the parts of listening is also to understand that it is a human interaction, which will always be to some degree flawed, you know, and to know that we always don't have to have the right words and uh, we're not going to hit the mark all the time. And so it's okay to take a minute and pause and just say, you know, if if you have space in that moment to say, okay, you know what, let me rephrase that, or let me go back to that point. Or um, sometimes I've been in situations where people have told me things and then I've just been, uh, I don't want to say shock, but it has sort of left me speechless to a certain degree where I cannot, um, uh, formulate the right words to say things without making sure that I'm not affirming the wrong things, right? And so um, I have had to, uh, after the conversation, go go back, maybe sit in, sit in prayer, kind of work through it myself, and then go back to the person to have a conversation and say, hey, you know what, I just wanted to go back to that conversation we had earlier, and this is really what I meant, and this is the clarity that I have now. So I think taking out that pressure sometimes can be helpful as well. Um, and it can, yeah, it can help us to make sure that we are not taking that, um, we're not we're not enabling and taking that burden of the responsibility of that choice from that person, you know? Um, so yeah, I think pressure probably and, and understanding that it's a human interaction, which is flawed can probably help too. Very true, yeah. yeah. So well, we're running out of time. Well, we have I have all day, but <laughs> everybody's got these. 
<laughs> to do. We've gone about an hour or so. Um, is there anything else that was really, really important to you that you'd like to discuss about the book? Do you have a copy of it there by any chance to hold up? Do you have? Oh, wow, I do. I, I, I mean, I read it on my computer as a PDF. <laughs> so <I'd like> to... <laughs> I thought I left it in my in the car, but it turns out it's, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, started listening to young And I assume it's, it's available on Amazon and it's available through Enroute. It was published by Enroute, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's available. Yeah, it's, it's available on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, what, what was that? I said I had a fly sort of. Oh, oh. After. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we're so really it's available. Um, and the title again is the the art of listening to young people. Is that correct? Yes, the art of listening to young people, a pastoral and scientific guide. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess one thing I'd say in general about the book um for those who are thinking about giving it a read, is we tried our best, best to bring together um, the sciences um, and you know, pastoral application and faith because um, it, it's 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 easy to make a lot of claims, you know, about things. And I guess one of the challenges in like pastoral ministry and is we could just say stuff, you know. And one one of the things we've appreciate about the sciences like okay like as a priest working with scientists and people and you know like jolly and others um i've come to really appreciate their their level of um trying to think of a more positive word than skepticism <laughs> but it's like you know uh okay is this proven is this demonstrated you know there's particularly one member of our team that's like that you know it's very okay where how has this been proven or demonstrated and so what that does is it leads us to a lot of rigor. And um, there's, if you go through the bibliography on this, um, there's just all kinds of scientific journals and experiments and things like that. I mean, even in terms of little things like what kind of gesture, you know, communicates that you're listening versus communicates that you're bored versus communicates that you're interested or whatever. But those are like experimentally verified. So it was, it was, fun, I would say, um, and meaningful, bringing together that the rigor of science with the genuine need and the call to listen to young people, you know, and I think that's something kind of unique um, about this book. So that, yeah. I think I would just piggyback onto that and and kind of a little bit of the background of the book was we, so as, as a research institute, we take a topic and then we research first, and then we think about what we can do with that content. So one of the previous topics, we made a white paper out of it. Um, and with this one, when we started researching it, I remember, you know, me and Father Thomas were on the phone and we're like, okay, what is the best way to deliver this content and who can really use it? And I just, we're like, maybe, maybe a book. And, and then I was like, well, I'm sure there's like a lot of books out there on listening to young people, you know? And I just did it as I was on the phone with him, I just did a really quick like search uh, on Google books. And you see, there's so many books on the art of, uh, on art of listening, but they were all sort of along the lines um, of one of them even said, you know, things like, okay, how do you talk? So young people would listen, you know, uh, versus just <laughs> listening to young people. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, or, or just in general, like listening, but, but nothing quite had that pragmatic scientific approach to it, um, as well as pastoral. So I think, um, this book is very, very unique in that way currently. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, that's sort of like the niche that it's providing, especially one of the chapters in there, which I mean, I think for all of our team members, probably the one that we love the most. Um, or were maybe mind blown by the book most was the one on the context of young people, the Gen Z, you know, it has so much data in there, which really helps us understand the young people and the context and where we're listening and to who we're listening, you know. So yeah, I would say that is definitely something um, uh, very unique about this book. I loved it. Um... It's, it's, I like that it was short and sweet. You know, I was able to say to people, it's like, like, a, like a little over a hundred pages, uh, very practical, um, well-written, it's very written for the lay person, which is nice. Uh, I think it's a great book for teachers, parents, counselors, priests, um, you know, who are dealing with young people all the time. 
Um, I was thinking I might have Sebastian add it to my list at the back of my home for the homily, um, because I talk about how homily is not not a monologue; it's a dialogue, and we, you know, and often trying to reach young people with the homily. Um, so there was a lot in it that could be applied to homiletics as well, um, which was exciting from that perspective Great. that I have. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's just a, a nice gem, nice little gem of a book that, you know, like just packs a punch, comes, gets to the points quickly and clearly. And I think you both did a great job with it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, exciting to have material like this that people can, you know, get their hands on. And um, like I said, even with my background in speech communication, there were there were things that I learned and loved and loved how you wrote them. So thank you. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you know that much more than us. I mean, with, with the number of books you have out, so... It's work, but it is fun. I, I love it. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for being here and sharing this time with me today. Um, Dr. Jolly, you want to end us with a prayer, please? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this time that you've given us, for the space this conversation has provided, Lord, and the way that you've inspired our hearts to listen to young people. We pray for all the listeners, and we ask that you continue to pour your Holy Spirit into each and every one's hearts, so that we may be more and more open um, to the space that you provide for listening. For this, we pray. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiki. It was wonderful, wonderful to, to meet you and uh, to have this conversation with you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Really enjoyed it and enjoyed the book. So hope it. I hope people, um, you know, get out there, buy it, give it as gifts. Great Christmas gift for people. Uh, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> Blessings. Bye.